Welcome to American Black Journal. I'm Stephen Henderson. When we think of African American entrepreneurs in the Detroit area, one of the first that comes to mind is John Barfield. He founded what is now the Bartech Group, a global supplier of workforce management and staffing solutions. The story of John Barfield's rise to success is told in a new book titled Starting from Scratch the humble beginnings of a $2 billion enterprise. A documentary on Barfield's life will debut on Monday during a Michigan Minority Business Week of events at the Charles H. Wright Museum. I started out to do something that would benefit my family. And as a result of many good fortunes and many wonderful people that I've met along the way, I have, been, I have been able to provide my family with educations and experiences that I never had. In a country in an era riven by racial oppression and struggle, it's impossible to find a single person who can embody those times. But there is one man who comes close, John W. Barfield born to poor southern sharecroppers, who went on to build a billion dollar international business, a family business. John Barfield is a really impressive serial entrepreneur. I mean, he's got deep entrepreneurial genes in him. You know, here's a guy who had a newspaper route. He was a door-to-door -door salesman. He worked as a janitor. He's an irrepressible presence that has to succeed at entrepreneurial ventures. Businessmen are made, entrepreneurs are born. And if you bring this back to John Barfield, he's an entrepreneur. He was born entrepreneur. He's a gentle soul, but he um, has the eye of the tiger. He uh, is truly the American dream. My father was an extraordinary man. He was big and a powerful physique and was maybe the kindest person I've ever known. He was too kind to even spank my sister and I. Uh, that was a job that my mother had to do. They, they taught us a lot of principles and I've been asked why, why they taught you these principles. That these were principles that were designed to protect us from God and man. Living in the South where we did, you could be lynched for nothing. We thought that Pennsylvania would be better when we found that Pennsylvania, for my folks, was almost as, as bad. My father had to work almost as hard, as hard there as he did in the South. Some blues are just blues, mine are the miners was not the best lifestyle. Most of the coal mines paid you in script. You know, they're working 12, 14 hour days and sometimes more than that. The life expectancy wasn't very high. There were deaths on a daily basis in most of these mines. Uh, it was probably the harshest of all the industries. I'm pleased to have John Barfield as my guest today. Welcome to American Black Journal. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, like many great success stories, uh, yours has very humble beginnings. Uh, born in Tuscaloosa, Al Alabama in 1927. But you, we were talking before the show uh, started, and you were telling me about being a janitor at the University of Michigan in 1949 and deciding from there to leave to start your own business. I want to start the interview there. Talk to me about what it was that, that, uh, that it led you to make that decision and made you think, this will turn out to be better than, than what I'm doing? Well, I left high school after the 10th grade. I was 16 years old. And uh, when I became 17 years old, I joined the US Army. And I served for two years in Germany and France and came back to this country without any skills. So I applied for a job at the University of Michigan as a wall washer. And at the end of the wall washing period, I was one of the people there that was offered a job as a custodian. Uh -huh. And I worked from 1949 to 1954 uh, as a janitor in the chemistry building. 
I left that job uh, in 1954, uh, but uh, the, the, the way I left it was uh, I had to find more income because my family was growing. Sure. And I noticed that they were building a number of homes on the west side of Ann Arbor. So I went to the builders and I said, uh, my name is John Barfield. Uh, I, I'd like to clean your houses for you. I can do them better, cheaper, and, and, uh, and, and uh, on, on time. Uh, would you give me an opportunity? And they did. And I made an amazing discovery. That discovery was that I could clean two small homes in a day. And I was paid $35 for each. So I was able to make as much in one day working for myself as I could in a whole week working for the university. <laughs> working for the university, right? So that's when I decided to leave the university and to become an entrepreneur. Yeah, but, but this is also a time when uh, African Americans weren't assumed to be able to, to manage companies, to build companies. Uh, tell me about some of the resistance uh, that, that you encountered early on and, and sort of how you navigated around it. Well, you're true. It, it was a, a time when African American women were thought not to be able to handle complex, uh, uh, profitable, large opportunities. Yeah. Uh, and it took a while before uh, people gave me an opportunity. But I uh, stayed with the university, and then <clears throat> when I left in 1954, I wrote a book called The Barfield Method of Building Maintenance, and I started cleaning commercial and industrial buildings. And 13 years after I left the University of Michigan, uh, I was uh, uh, met by a number of large corporations. There were Consolidated uh, Foods, Mackey Corporation, the Sanitas Corporation, International Telephone, all wanting to buy my business. So I sold the business in 1969 to IT&T for one of the largest multiples that they'd ever paid at that time for a contract cleaning service. Uh-huh, uh-huh. And, and how do you get from there to the Barfield Group? Uh, well, the Bartech Group, I should say. In 1975, I got a call from the General Motors Corporation asking me would I be interested in coming out. They had a proposal for me. So I went out to the hydromatic plant uh, there and, and the, they, they said, would you help us find minorities and women that we could buy goods and services from? That was right after the boycott. Yeah. And I think our leaders went to the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the large corporations that we, we buy your goods and services, but you don't give us time. Give you, us don't buy, you don't give us any of it. Sure. Unless you change that, we're going to boycott. And that's what started this minority business development program. So after a year of looking, we found only one African-American, and his business was uh, selling corrugated boxes back to the corporations. And that's when they said, uh, John, we have, a, we have a proposal for you. Uh, we'd like for you to uh, clean up some old engineering drawings for us. And if you can uh, do this to our satisfaction, uh, in six months, uh, we'll continue to give you opportunities. And that was the beginning of the Bartek Group. Uh, we started that company with six students from Washtenaw Community College. And today, that company has grown to over 3,000 employees. Wow, wow. Uh, so, I mean, as I said in the open, I mean, uh, you can't talk about business or black business in Detroit without talking about you and the things that, that you have done. Uh, it's been a long time for you, though. I mean, that, that you've been that you've been at this, and you've seen a lot of change mm -hmm. uh, over that time in the city, in business. Uh, what what do you see today as the things that that uh, are either opportunities uh, for African Americans who want to start their own businesses, or things that are still obstacles? Well, I I I don't see a lot of uh, intelligent effort going on to start black businesses. Interestingly enough, I was uh, asked by the Detroit public school system to come up with an idea uh -huh. of how we could create more black businesses, particularly with the students attending uh, 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 high schools. And I met with them the other day uh, and gave them an idea of embedding an entrepreneurial training program at every high school in the city of, uh, in the city of, of Detroit. Yeah. Um, we really have to do a better job of providing opportunities for our young people. And, and we don't, I mean, schools in general are not teaching 
kids to be entrepreneurs. I mean, they, they are really uh, geared toward, you know, sending kids into careers, I think. Mm -hmm. and, and there's not that much focus on the idea that, uh, well, maybe you could, you could start your own thing and sort of control your own destiny. Yeah. Uh, you know, one of the things that I think has held us back as a people is we have not realized the true value of our time and our talents. And that's what started me off on my road to success. Yeah. Uh, we think that uh, we don't realize sometimes the difference between ordinary income and meaningful wealth. Uh, what we have to begin to teach our people is that uh, it, it's not about ordinary income. The whole purpose of working is to create wealth. For yourself. Yeah, for yourself. <laughs> and your family. And, right. uh, and, and until we learn to do that, we, we will not have the success we, we're looking for. And, and what are some of the things that, that you have to think of uh, when you're doing that? I mean, what are the practical things that you need to teach kids uh, when they're teenagers or in high school that lead them to, to thinking that way? Well, let me give you an example. <clears throat> I worked for the university for six years. And at the end of the six year, I was making $70 a week. Uh, then I, I started my own business and, uh, and then I left the university. But if I had worked for the University of Michigan for 14 more years, it would have total, been a total of 20 years. And if I had gotten a 5% increase for each one of those 14 years, at the end of a 20 year career, I would have been making $8,000 a year, right. which would not have been enough to provide the education for my children. So I would have been trapped. I would not have made any progress myself and my children would not have made any progress. Sure. As a result of leaving, I was able to send my children to good schools. I was able to buy a nice home for my family, and I was able to enjoy some of the amenities that we all hope and pray to have. If I had continued to work for the university, none of that would have happened. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we have to uh, learn uh, that we have only so many hours in a lifetime to work, right. and uh, if you spend all of that time uh, working as an employee of others, uh, you will create ordinary wealth, but you won't create meaningful in, me, meaningful wealth. Yeah. And that's what we should be working toward. I mean, at the same time, uh, if you're someone who has that job, that, that job that has a, a steady paycheck mm -hmm. and seems to promise uh, opportunity for growth, it's, it can be scary to, to say, well, I'll give this up. Uh, in favor of something that that is is riskier, and maybe maybe it will work, but maybe it will pay me less. Uh, how do you how do you get people to overcome that? Well, you you, you had to be very careful. A, a lot of people are encouraging people to quit their biz jobs and to become entrepreneurs, full time entrepreneurs. We think that's very dangerous because most new business ventures they fail. fail right? They fail. So we encourage people not to do that, to be, but to become part time entrepreneurs. Uh, Find something that you can do yes. while you're still working. Yes. For example, if you were a skilled worker and, uh, and you made uh, uh, 20, 20, $25 an hour uh, and you worked for a corporation that paid you that, um, you should realize that I'm worth more than that. Really, what I'm worth is what my boss charges for my time. Well, right, right. So we try to encourage people to start their own businesses on a part-time basis, uh, to become, if you will, a, a company of one. Yeah. To work full-time, but to w spend some of your time working part-time. And when you do that, you have to realize how to charge for your services. For example, if I'm a, a skilled worker and I make $30 an hour, uh, I have to realize that my employer marks my time up 150 yeah, percent sure. or more, <laughs> and he gets the he now. gets the the difference between what he pays us and what he charges his other uh, customers, sure. and that's how he builds wealth. At the same time, the people that are providing that opportunity for him build no wealth at all. Yeah. Yeah. So we try to get people to work for themselves on a part-time basis. Sure. Uh, we've got about a minute left. Uh, tell me about one thing that you say or would say to young people. I mean, looking back on your life and your uh, career, if, if you had one piece of advice for young people to, to sort of follow in that path or, or to forge a different path that, that, that would be equally successful, what would, that, what would that one thing be? I would say to you that the only way that you can find the path to wealth is to realize the value of your time and your talents. 
that's when you can begin to move forward. Yeah. Uh, not to rely on other people to tell you what you're worth, but to realize uh, your value yourself. Uh, and, uh, and to have the confidence to do that. I to mean, move that's, forward. That's one to of move the real forward. hurdles, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it's not hard to be successful when you realize how valuable you are. Yeah, yeah. All right, uh, wonderful uh, advice and congratulations on uh, all your success and on the documentary. Well, thank you very much. I'm very proud of the book and I think it was written with humility and deference and I think there's some good principles and some good lessons and I hope more people will read it. Yes. May I have a minute to say one other thing? Sure. Uh, 40 years ago, I made a, 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 a pledge to our Rotary Club in Ypsilanti uh, to raise enough money to provide vaccinations for a million African children uh -huh. from polio. Uh -huh. uh, after two years, uh, we had not, we did not reach our goal, but we did uh, raise enough money to vaccinate 497,000 African children. Wow. So I went to the Rotary Foundation a year ago and I said, if you will endorse my book to your 1.2 million members, I'll give you $15 of the price back for every $27 book that you sell. Uh, my goal is, and my hope is that they will sell 5% of, uh, of uh, their rotaries uh, will purchase a book. Yeah. And if they do, it would provide uh, a ni about $900,000 that would be used to provide vo polio vas vaccinations for, for African children. African children. Wow. So wow. that's my goal. That's, a, that's an outstanding goal. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for being here. I'm pleased to be here. Yeah.